And the answer is, oh, you didn't need to know how long the chromosome was at all. If there's only 200 people in the class, there can only be 400 total versions of the chromosome. It's unlikely that any of them are going to be identical because the chromosome is so big. It's, every one of them is almost certainly going to be different. So 400 is the right answer. Now let's think about kinds of DNA sequence differences. We already introduced the concept of alleles, different versions or variants of a gene. But now we're going to think about alleles in the context of DNA sequences. And a term that we commonly use is a single nucleotide variant, often abbreviated as an SNV. Um, that just means the presence in a population of different nucleotides at homologous positions in the two DNA sequences. So we have to be comparing homologous positions. We can tell that in this diagram here. First, we can tell that this diagram is a diagram of two different DNA sequences being compared. It's not a diagram showing the base pairing between two different strands of one DNA molecule. And we can tell that first because it's labeled genome 1, genome 2, not 5' prime end, 3' prime end. We can also tell very clearly because at any given position, the two bases are identical. There's a G here and a G here. There's a C here and a C here. At every position, except for one, the bases are identical. And at every position where the bases are identical, there's a vertical line. And that tells us that these vertical lines mean this is a position where the two sequences, the two genomes, have identical sequences. But there's one position where the genomes have different sequences. That's here. And that represents a single nucleotide variant, just one position where there is variation. Two different versions are present. Now, there's another kind of DNA sequence difference that we need to be aware of. And that's got the rather corny name of indel. And I'll explain in a second why that, where that word comes from. So we're, what we're talking about here are genetic differences, not created by changing one base to a different base, but by inserting or deleting bases, one or more bases, into a DNA segment, which changes the length of the DNA segment. So you can see, again, we're comparing two DNA sequences, but one's longer than the other. The term indel is used because when we're comparing two DNA sequences and we find that they're different lengths, we don't know that the difference, which is marked here, arose because something was inserted into this sequence or because something was deleted from an ancestor of this sequence. And indel is just a compromise word in del because we don't know which it is. Now, when we compare two DNA sequences, I emphasized in the previous slide, they needed to be homologous. And that means, from our definition of homology from earlier, that they're similar because of shared descent from a common ancestor. So when we're comparing two positions, we want to be sure that those two positions are different, the same or different versions of a base, that they were both inherited from a single position in a common ancestor. We don't want to be comparing what were different positions in the common ancestor. So let's compare these two sequences. And I'm telling you that these sequences are homologous. So let's compare them. We draw, again, we draw a vertical line for each position where the sequences are identical and go, well, they don't look very homologous. I mean, we expect one base in four to match just by chance. This doesn't look very promising at all. Maybe they're not lined up right. So let's shift them over one and try again. No, that's still pretty bad. Okay, let's shift them over a bit more. Aha! Now we have the right alignment. And we can be, we see that almost every position matches. Now we're confident that the homologous positions are aligned.
And that's critical when we're comparing sequences. You won't normally have to do any alignments yourself, but you really should be aware that this is important. And the reason it matters is because some sequence variation is indels. Insertions and deletions are fairly common in chromosomes, and you can't just start at the end of two homologous chromosomes and just line up all the bases and compare them. You have to make sure in different positions that they're correctly aligned so the alignment reflects homology. Now, it's time to think about the frequency of alleles and genotypes in a population, because this will be critical for a lot of the analysis that we do. In particular, it'll be important for the last lecture when we talk about um, the evolution of human genetic differences. So the allele frequency in a population is really, really simple. It's just the number of occurrences of that allele divided by the number of total alleles in the population. That's the frequency. Sounds easy, but what if you don't actually know the frequency, then you haven't counted the alleles. You've, what if you've only counted the genotypes? What if you surveyed the population, you took a sample of people, and you determined their genotypes at a particular position that you're interested in, and these are the numbers that you got? Can you calculate the frequency of one or the other allele? Sure, it's easy. So we know the denominator we know that there are 92 people. Each person has two alleles, so that's 184 alleles in the whole sample of the population. And we're assuming that this is a large enough sample that it's representative of the population. What's the frequency of the T allele? Well, 22 people, so 57 people don't have a T allele at all. We don't need to worry about them. 22 people have one T and one C allele. So that's 22 T's. And 13 people have two T's. Those people are going to contribute 26 T's. So 22, 26, 48 T alleles tells us that the frequency of T is 0 0.26, 0 0.26. So that's not hard. That's simple arithmetic. What about the other way around? What if we want to think about genotype frequencies in a population? Well, the basic calculation is still really simple. It's just the number of occurrences of a particular genotype out of the total number of genotypes, which is the total number of individuals in the population. But what if we only know the allele frequencies? Often when you're given a description of a population, you're given the allele frequencies, but not the genotype frequencies. Well, again, the calculation is pretty simple, but I'm going to show you a diagrammatic way to do it. So in this case, let's assume that we have the allele frequencies for two alleles in the population and that the other two alleles aren't present. As you'll see, this is a typical case for real alleles. And we want to know the frequency of the AT genotype. Now, I'm going to show you a, a trick that... Um, might look kind of like the Punnett squares that you might have encountered if you learned basic genetics at some point, except I'm drawing the square off, side, off center. And it's just a way of illustrating what happens when alleles come together at random, as if when people married each other and had children, they did not check their genotype at this particular position in their genome before they did it, which is the normal case for almost every aspect of our genome. Mating is random with respect to genotype. Then we can just predict just um, from basic probability the frequencies of the genotypes that are going to be present in the population. So we know that 0.8 of the population has A's and we're going to draw that A 0.8 and 0.2 of the population has T T Point two. And we can simply then look at the picture and say, oh, yeah, of course, the chance of A meeting A is going to be, to give the A A genotype, is going to be 0.8 squared, which is 0.64. And the chance of T meeting T to give the T T genotype is going to be 
squared equals 0.04. Now what we're interested in though is the chance of T meeting A or A meeting T and these frequencies are again just the product of the frequencies of the alleles. So it's 0.8 times 0.2 equals 0.16 for this one and for this one. So now we've got two occurrences of this genotype. They're just written in different orders, but it's the same genotype. So we're going to multiply this number by 2 to get 0.32. That's the frequency of the AT genotype. And we can check easily that we've done the arithmetic right by checking whether our numbers add up. So we've got 0.4 of those and 0.64 of those and 0.32 of those, does that add up to the whole population? Yes, it adds up to one, so we can be confident that we've done the calculation right. Now, now that we know how to think about allele frequencies and populations, I have to introduce some terminology. Um, if a genetic difference is present in less than 1% of the population, it's usually described as being a rare variant. But if it's present in at least 1% of the alleles in the population, there's another term uh, that's very widely used. It's called a polymorphism. Until recently, geneticists have spent a lot more time studying polymorphisms than studying rare variants, just because they're a lot easier to find and to study. We're only now developing the tools to study rare variants, and we'll talk a little bit about this in module Five. Module 5. Yeah, I think that's right. So, there's, now if we introduce into this, again, the single nucleotide variants. Remember, single nucleotide variants are differences that are affecting a single position in a DNA sequence. Rare single nucleotide variants, we can have rare single nucleotide variants, but as I said, they're hard to study. The easy kind of variation to study, and by far the most common variation in the genome, are what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, abbreviated SNP. And because they're talked about a lot, we have a way to say this, they're called SNPs. And SNPs are very common variation in populations. They're very easy to study. They're the foundation of all of the personal genomics that we'll introduce in Module 6. So this is a very important concept to get straight. If, if these two variants are, if each of these variants is present at at least 1% of the population, this would be a SNP. If this was very, very common and this was very, very rare, we'd say, well, it's a rare single nucleotide variant. We're not going to study it. It's too difficult. Now, most polymorphisms have only two common alleles, like the uh, polymorphism that I introduced when we were doing our arithmetic. Here's an example. This is a small segment of the BRCA2 gene that we described earlier um, that includes high-risk alleles that cause a high risk of breast cancer. And this is a diagram showing the known SNPs, the known single nucleotide polymorphisms, in this segment of the genome. That's about 20 kilobases long. And I'll circle the variation so you can recognize the diagram. It's a little tricky to interpret. Each vertical pair describes a SNP at that particular position. So here, there are three different SNPs present at this position in the intron. Here are three SNPs in this small exon. Here are five SNPs in this exon. Here's one SNP in the middle of the intron. And you can see that there are lots of SNPs, both in introns and in exons, and that there are always only two alleles are common. There may be rare individuals who might have a C or a G, 
but they're sufficiently rare that they don't count as polymorphisms and they're not normally considered. Now I want to introduce one more concept and that's the concept of a haplotype. We need this for the next lecture. So a haplotype is just the genotype, instead of being the genotype of a particular position, it's the genotype of a segment of the chromosome. It's used in, in slightly other variations in other contexts, but for us, for now, this will, this will capture it nicely. So here we're showing the sequences of a little bit of the chromosome of the genomes of two different individuals. And we see that, oh, there are four different places where they have different bases in their DNA. We would describe this collection of variation, this segment of variation, as a haplotype. So we could say this is the haplotype that has a T at this position and an A at this position, sorry, a T at position 2 and an A at position 16 and a T at position 20 and a C at position 28. This is a haplotype that has a G at position 2 and a G at position 16 and an A at position 20 and a G at position 28. So this has been a long lecture, the longest lecture of Module 1. And we've introduced a lot of new material um, building on the previous lectures. We talked about kinds of sequence variation, how we can compare DNA sequences, why it matters how we line up the bases, because some sequence variation is changing the lengths of DNA sequences. We talked quite a lot about alleles and genotypes in populations. We did some calculations, and we introduced a number of new terms, homozygous and heterozygous, polymorphism, SNP, indale, haplotype. These terms are going to come up again and again in the course. Now we're ready for the last lecture of Module 1. We're coming back to the question of how genetically different are different people, and we're going to use that and some advanced DNA sequencing techniques to answer the compelling question of whether or not our ancestors really did have sex with Neanderthals. I hope to see you there.